Hello, welcome to this edition of uh, Museum Moments. My name is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the education director here, and we're sorry we were having some technical uh, issues, but I think we're all together. So today I'm dressed just like I'm always dressed, or wait, I'm dressed as I envision um, a person at a feast in Persia in the mm -hmm. in Shushan at the time of Ahasuerus would be dressed. And we're going to be talking with Hazan Jeremy Stein. Hazan is another word for cantor, uh, a Jewish clergy member. Um, and we're going to be talking to Hazan Jeremy Stein about Purim today. Hazan Stein is the cantor at Congregation Israel Beth, uh, Congregation Beth Israel Neret Hamid. It's a funny because it's my synagogue, so I should know it. Um, and let's start out. Why costumes? Both of us have some kind of silly jackets on. Yours is less silly than mine. Um, and what's the meaning of this? What 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 are we doing here today? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Ellie, for having me. Uh, Purim is such a fun holiday, and uh, the uh, Megillat Esther, the book that we read on Purim, is one that's both full of humor, but specifically uh, humor involving um, not if uh, you know hidden identities and identities being revealed, and things being um, the Hebrew word is hafuch, meaning turned backwards or turned upside down, and so costumes uh, are a way of reenacting um, the narrative of Purim, but also just as on Purim things get you know uh, turned upside down, turned on their heads, the uh, weak become the powerful, the powerful become the weak. Um, that which is celebrated becomes base, and that which is base becomes celebrated. Costumes are a way of uh, reenacting that sense of hafuch, of, um, of both uh, hidden identity, hiding identities and revealing, but also of um, making light of what would normally be serious. So what is the central story of Purim? Because, you know, most Jewish holidays, many Jewish holidays have a story, this one in particular. Tell us about that kind of piece of Purim. Yeah. So in Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, um, the Jews are living in Persia during the time of the uh, Babylonian exile. And they seem to be doing okay. Um, one of their members, Mordechai, even has a, uh, a place uh, in the king's court, and he has um, his cousin or, or, or niece Esther hide her Jewish identity, and uh, she is able to become the queen of Persia. And so, right right off the bat, we have this um, this hidden identity uh, that uh, yeah. Um, so she has. You know, es Esther, in a, in a sense, is wearing a costume. She is pretending, um, at least pretending not to be who she is. And this becomes really important when the villain of the Megillah, whose name is Haman. No! Um, everybody we'll at play home, that out in a bit. You know, yeah, why everybody can join in uh, at home. Um, when Haman, no! the villain... Um, is angry at Mordecai, who will not bow down to him. And there's a, a much more involved story behind that. He decides he's going to kill all of the Jews throughout the kingdom. And it is, uh, Esther has to decide, does she remain hidden? If the king doesn't know that she's Jewish, she might be saved. Um, but does she remain keep her identity hidden? Or does she tell the king who she really is, hoping that he will then save all of the Jews? So that, in a very condensed nutshell, is the story of uh, Purim. We're getting some nice jackets and booths from the peanut gallery out there. But um, that, that kind of very... So she steps up and saves the day. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also this thing in reading the Megillah, the Book of Esther... Uh, that you, anytime you hear the name of that villain, you say, you, you say boo, that it's a really, there is a family friendly, this is a very fun holiday. And yet at its core, the message of the holiday, and even with all of the trappings of costumes and fun and jubilation, 
is a hard message. It's a message about, you know, ethnic hatred and it's a message about baseless killing and all of, and uh, having to fear who for your life because of who you are. Um, so how do you, how does those, those two pieces kind of jive together? Well, I think that that it actually is in fact, part of that whole hafuch, that opposite business of Purim is, um, is taking what would what would normally be a very grave, serious situation, and making light of it. And um, there are, you know, theories. In fact, that um, the book of the book of Esther is, in fact, um, a parody in and of itself. That is sort of making light of what is is normally uh, a serious uh, situation of Jews living in exile. Uh, dealing with um, both the benefits and dangers of assimilation and dealing with um, baseless hatred and anti-Semitism and xenophobia and, you know, turning that, those very serious, you know, for this one day or this one, you know, this one night and one day, turning these very serious and grave matters, uh, making light of them making them hafuch, making them opposite. One of my favorite customs around Purim is the custom of the Purim spiel. And, and the mm -hmm. reason I wanted a chazan to be my guest today and not a rabbi is because I feel like the Purim spiel often is the realm of the chazan in a, in a congregation, at least in our congregation. This is your, you know, your sweet spot here. Um, where did this, can you describe what a spiel looks like? Because there are all sorts of variations. And then how did this evolve? So a spiel is like a, a play of sort um, or routine. And the poem spiel is a way of retelling. We, we, re, we retell the, um, when we read the Megillah, we are in effect retelling the story of Purim. But a spiel is a way of doing it. Uh, and the reading itself is done in a very lighthearted fashion. There are... Um, you know, there are funny melodies some people put in. Some people do different voices for different characters. Uh, the fact that we boo every time we say Haman. Boo! Yeah, you know, you know, we don't usually do that in synagogue. We, we don't make a ruckus uh, in synagogue. But um, the Miguel, in retelling the story in this very formal way, we are still adding levity to it. But the Purim Spiel is a way of retelling it in an even more often more silly, um, you know, more uh, comical way. And so a uh, traditional spiel might uh, retell the story, you know, um, you'll often see congregations will do a poem spiel based on Wizard of Oz or based on the music of Billy Joel. Uh, and th that tells the story again in a humorous way. Um, those pop culture references, yeah. making it, you know, engaging and... yeah. But uh, at, at its sense, really what we're going for is, is being silly. Again, taking a, what would normally be a, a serious uh, thing of retelling a, a passage of the Bible, we do it in a very silly way. Uh, with and it's not an American custom. This, is, this predates... Oh, sure. You know, this, this, um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I think even, the, uh, even in the Talmud, there are references to um, you know, levity on Purim. And, uh, you know, I mean, this, um, you know, um, you know, finding ways to retell the story or even if, um, um, you know, it would be uh, it would be common in uh, yeshivot where people are, are studying Torah. You know, you would write songs parodying your, your Rosh Yeshiva, your teacher, which normally would you would never do that. But um, Purim was, was, that was, permissible. was a rare opportunity where, where you could do. Uh, things like that. So yeah, no, the Purim spiel, um, well, you know, doing it to, uh, to, um, you know, uh, you know to, to, uh, to the theme of a movie or a rock star is, is certain would certainly be modern, but the idea of retelling it in a humorous way is, is very old. So this year we're in a little bit of a different universe. Um, you know that. I, I, yeah. You know, in fact, the last time I was in synagogue was on Purim in 2020. 
or 5780. That's the last time I was physically in synagogue. So, um, which I will also say boo to that too. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so how are we, how are you planning and how are others of your colleagues kind of trying to engage that silliness while we're in the zoom -iverse? I'll be honest, it's hard. Uh, one thing we're doing, one thing we've noticed uh, really from the beginning of virtual synagogue is that as much as we have to be cognizant of time and duration of service and program when they're in person, all the more so when it's on Zoom. Uh, it wasn't long after Zoom uh, became the norm that uh, the Yiddish uh, speakers came up with the term oiskazumt, which means <laughs> like out, out zoomed, you're, you're zoomed out, you're zoomed out. And so we've had to adjust a lot of our uh, services and programming based on just the, the understanding that um, forgetting the limitations of what you can do in a Zoom program or service, it's just there's only so much screen time that people can take, um, both at any given time and during any given week or month. So that has been a year long adjustment. In terms of Purim, we are doing, we are still committed to reciting the Gansa Megillah, the full Megillah, and we'll be doing that on Zoom. Uh, we will be, for people who um, don't have a full uh, Gansa Megillah in them for Zoom, we totally understand, especially for children, um, we are doing a half hour beforehand, we're doing an abbreviated I'm calling it a mini Megillah, where we do, where I pick, you know, um, a few verses from each chapter to chant in Hebrew and in English. And while that's going on, we'll have a couple people kind of uh, comically, dramatically acting out what's going on. A little bit of a Zoom spiel. A Zoom spiel, exactly. And we'll still have, we always have a um, a, a, porum, a costume past pageant where we invite all the kids uh, to come on the Bima and show off their costume and say who they are. This year, we're going to have a uh, mask parade. Get it? Mask parade, where uh, everyone who's there in costume, there you go, will be able to show off uh, their costume on Zoom. And uh, again, that that's an example of um, you know the mask. I mean, there, there's very little that's more serious these days than wearing a mask. And we're taking the opportunity on Purim to have a little levity um, with mask wearing, mask wearing and giving it a, a little silly twist. Now, I know you are someone who takes costumes very seriously. And in generally, like you've grown out your facial hair, you've shaved your beard, you've done lots of work to be like so is, can you give us any hint as to what you're going to be this year? Or is that too much? In no, well, um, I never I, I never give away my costume, but no. um, I will say it's that um, I was not a big costume wearer growing up. I always did something as a kid, but it was never a big thing. But when I became a, when I got into the, when I became a synagogue uh, professional, I was like, you know what? I really ought to do it up. And it's something that I've, I've grown to love. So um, someone actually did ask me at Minion the other day. They said, you know, this is the time of year when everybody makes bets on why, you know, on your facial hair. Are you growing it out? Are you growing it out for something? Are you growing it out to shave us and surprise and surprise us? And then I said, you know what? It's a mask theme. So it really doesn't even matter what I'm wearing. The uh, real question is, is there going to be body paint and hair dye that are required? <laughs> there was a, a note that generally Hazan Stein's costumes require body paint and uh, face extensive face paint and and mostly hair dye. I know I shared one picture of him as Obi Wan Kenobi. There was extensive dye, but yeah, either um, well, and hair dye and makeup are also those are two things I never did as a kid. And I just what, when Amanda and I dressed up as mimes that one time, I was I, I got hooked. And it was any time. Now it's like up. all of the no. theatricality in you. It just this is the time of year it comes out. No, no. I will say there there will be no uh, makeup and hair dye, not because of lack of 
revelry, but simply because the mask is my main costume. And Got so it. the mask will obscure, will obscure any, uh, any of that makeup. So um, my only hint is that, um, you know what? I can't even give a hint because that might out the rest of my family. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Jeremy, I know you have a CD that just came out. Yeah. Um, if you want to give it one quick plug and then we'll wrap sure. up. Sure. And actually, there is a, a, um, a little bit of a Purim tie-in. I am recording a CD of original music that I've written for Havdalah, four of the five songs I wrote during quarantine. And uh, it will be released uh, at the end of the spring as a, um, and you can pre-order it, but it's a benefit for Jewish summer camps, which were hit very hard last summer. Most of them were closed. And so um, all of the music I've written for Havdalah is really written with a camp flair. Uh, so I don't know if you can, I can, can I put it in the chat where they can, yeah, where can get it? Sure. Totally. Um, so that'll be in our chat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I have to thank our sponsor, Robin Cohen, for making this merry uh, museum moment available and all of the others. Join us next week. We're going to be talking about the hippie program. It is not a costume program, but it is a really important, uh, it's a really important program that women have supported throughout the Milwaukee community. So join us again. And thank you, Jeremy, so much for coming. My pleasure, Ellie. Thank you for having me.